www.podchef.motime.com Part 2 Chapter 2 But the period of my dissipation would end, and I always felt very sick afterwards. It was followed by remorse. I tried to drive it away. I felt too sick. By degrees, however, I got used to all that, too. I grew used to everything, or rather, I voluntarily resigned myself to enduring it. But I had a means of escape that reconciled everything. That was to find refuge in the sublime and the beautiful, in dreams, of course. I was a terrible dreamer. I would dream for three months on end, tucked away in my corner, and you may believe me that at those moments I had no resemblance to the gentleman who, in the perturbation of his chicken heart, put a collar of German beaver on his greatcoat. I suddenly became a hero. I would not have admitted my six-foot lieutenant, even if he had called on me. I could not even have pictured him before me then. What were my dreams, and how I could satisfy myself with them? It is hard to say now, but at the time I was satisfied with them, though indeed even now I am to some extent satisfied with them. Dreams were particularly sweet and vivid after a spell of dissipation. They came with remorse and with tears and curses and transports. There were moments of such positive intoxication, of such happiness, that there was not the faintest trace of irony within me, on my honor. I had faith hope, love. I believed blindly at such times that by some miracle, by some external circumstance, all this would suddenly open out, expand, that suddenly a vista of suitable activity, beneficent, good, and above all, ready-made. What sort of activity I had no idea, but the great thing was that it should be all ready for me, would rise up before me, and I could come out into the light of day, almost riding a white horse and crowned with laurel. Anything but the foremost place I could not conceive for myself, and for that very reason I quite contentedly occupied the lowest in reality. Either to be a hero or to grovel in the mud, there was nothing in between. That was my ruin, for when I was in the mud I comforted myself with the thought that at other times I was a hero, and the hero was a cloak for the mud. For an ordinary man it was shameful to defile himself, but a hero was too lofty to be utterly defiled, and so he might defile himself. It is worth noting that these attacks of the sublime and the beautiful visited me even during the period of dissipation, and just at the times when I was touching the bottom. They came in separate spurts, as though reminding me of themselves, but did not banish the dissipation by their appearance. On the contrary, they seemed to add zest to it by contrast, and were only sufficiently present to serve as an appetizing sauce. That sauce was made up of contradictions and sufferings, of agonizing inward analysis, and all these pangs and pinpricks gave a certain piquancy, even a significance to my dissipation, in fact, completely answered the purpose of an appetizing sauce. There was a certain depth of meaning in it, and I could hardly have resigned myself to the simple, vulgar, direct debauchery of a clerk, and have endured all the filthiness of it. What could have allured me about it then, and have drawn me at night into the street? No, I had a lofty way of getting out of it all. And what loving-kindness, oh Lord, what loving-kindness I felt at times in those dreams of mine, in those flights into the sublime and the beautiful. Though it was fantastic love, though it was never applied to anything human in reality, yet there was so much of this love that one did not feel afterwards even the impulse to apply it in reality. That would have been superfluous. Everything, however, passed satisfactorily by a lazy and fascinating transition into the sphere of art, that is, into the beautiful forms of life, lying ready, largely stolen from the poets and novelists, and adapted to all sorts of needs and uses. I, for instance, was triumphant over everyone. Everyone, of course, was in dust and ashes, and was forced spontaneously to recognize my superiority, and I forgave them all. 
I was a poet and a grand gentleman. I fell in love. I came in for countless millions and immediately devoted them to humanity, and at the same time I confessed before all the people my shameful deeds, which, of course, were not merely shameful, but had in them much that was sublime and beautiful, something in the Manfred style. Everyone would kiss me and weep. What idiots they would have been if they did not. Well, I should go barefoot and hungry, preaching new ideas and fighting victorious Austerlitz against the obscurantists. Then the band would play a march, and amnesty would be declared. The Pope would agree to retire from Rome to Brazil. Then there would be a ball for the whole of Italy at the Villa Borghese on the shores of Lake Como. Lake Como being for the purpose transferred to the neighborhood of Rome. Then would come a scene in the bushes, and so on, and so on, as though you did not know all about it. You will say that it is vulgar and contemptible to drag all this into public, after all the tears and transports which I myself have confessed. But why is it contemptible? Can you imagine that I am ashamed of it all, and that it was stupider than anything in your life, gentlemen? And I can assure you that some of these fancies were by no means badly composed. It did not happen all on the shores of Lake Como. And yet you're right. It really is vulgar and contemptible. And most contemptible of all is that now I am attempting to justify myself to you. And even more contemptible than that is my making this remark now. But that's enough, or there'll be no end to it. Each step will be more contemptible than the last. I could never stand more than three months of dreaming at a time without feeling an irresistible desire to plunge into society. To plunge into society meant to visit my superior at the office, Anton Antonich Sechotchkin. He was the only permanent acquaintance I have had in my life, and I wonder at this fact now myself. But I only went to see him when that phase came over me, and when my dreams had reached such a point of bliss that it became essential at once to embrace my fellows and all mankind. And for that purpose I needed at least one human being actually existing. I had to call on Anton Antonich, however, on Tuesday, his at-home day, so I had always to time my passionate desire to embrace humanity so that it might fall on a Tuesday. This Anton Antonich lived on the fourth story in a house in five corners, in four low-pitched rooms, one smaller than the other, of a particularly frugal and sallow appearance. He had two daughters and their aunt, who used to pour out the tea. Of the daughters, one was thirteen and another fourteen. They both had snub noses, and I was awfully shy of them, because they were always whispering and giggling together. The master of the house usually sat in his study on a leather couch in front of the table with some grey-headed gentleman, usually a colleague from our office or some other department. I never saw more than two or three visitors there, always the same. They talked about the excise duty, about the business in the Senate, about salaries and promotions, about His Excellency, and the best means of pleasing him, and so on. I had the patience to sit like a fool beside these people for hours at a stretch, listening to them without knowing what to say to them, or venturing to say a word. I became stupefied. Several times I felt myself perspiring. I was overcome by a sort of paralysis. But this was pleasant and good for me. On returning home I deferred for a time my desire to embrace all mankind. I had, however, one other acquaintance of a sort, Simonov, who was an old schoolfellow. I had a number of schoolfellows, indeed, in Petersburg, but I did not associate with them, and had even given up nodding to them in the street. I believe I had transferred into the department I was in simply to avoid their company, and to cut off all connection with my hateful childhood. Curses on that school and all those terrible years of penile servitude! In short, I parted from my schoolfellows as soon as I got out into the world. There were two or three left, to whom I nodded in the street. One of them was Simonov, who had in no way been distinguished at school, 
was of a quiet and equitable disposition. But I discovered in him a certain independence of character, and even honesty I don't even suppose that he was particularly stupid. I had at one time spent some rather soulful moments with him, but these had not lasted long, and had somehow been suddenly clouded over. He was evidently uncomfortable at these reminiscences, and was, I fancy, always afraid that I might take up the same tone again. I suspect that he had an aversion for me, but still I went on going to see him, not being quite certain of it. And so, on one of these occasions, unable to endure my solitude, and knowing that as it was Thursday Anton Antonitch's door would be closed, I thought of Simonov. Climbing up to his fourth story, I was thinking that the man disliked me, and that it was a mistake to go and see him. But as it always happened that such reflections impelled me, as though purposely, to put myself into a false position, I went in. It was almost a year since I had last seen Simonov. End Part 2 Chapter 2